Welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. The episode you're about to listen to is a conversation about the nature of consciousness and the relationship between consciousness and moral philosophy. This episode I'm releasing both in the usual way, just as an audio-only podcast, but there's also a YouTube version where you can see us talking. Um, so if you're interested in consuming this media a different way, I'll drop the link to the YouTube version in the episode description. I don't think it really matters, but I'm just trying to use the YouTube channel a little bit more, experiment with different formats for the podcast um, for people who might be interested in engaging with it that way. So yeah, my guest today is Jack Symes. Jack is a public philosopher, podcast host. He is a researcher at the University of Liverpool and will probably be best known to many of you as the host of the Pansycast, which is another philosophy podcast that's very popular and those of you who are into this may already have heard of it. He's also, and the topic of this conversation, just released um, Philosophers on Consciousness, which is a book based on the material from his podcast that's pretty similar, at least in structure. Obviously a different topic, but pretty similar in structure to the book I just released on freedom. So this episode is really a conversation, a back and forth. We start by talking about how we but just both approach having podcasts and doing public philosophy, how we think about sometimes some of the criticism we get. And then we get into a pretty interesting back and forth on how what we might think about consciousness might impact what we think about morality in particular circumstances. You'll see me here really like this wasn't rehearsed or anything, really trying to like work through some problems in real time. So I hope I made sense doing that. But irrespective of that, um, this was just a really fun, engaging conversation to have. Um, I enjoyed having it, and I hope you enjoy listening to it, or or watching it. Um, and by the way, um, do subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already, because I am going to be trying to get um, a little bit more video content out there. So if that's of interest, um, links to everything are on the website, politicalphilosophypodcast.com. Apart from that, oh, as always, as always, let me quickly uh, plug my Patreon. As you know, this show does not do any commercial advertisements. I don't do sponsors. I don't try and pause the show to sell you underwear or men's balding products, which I'm eventually going to start needing. Um, as necessary as those products might be, I think it spoils the flow of conversations like this to interrupt them for that. So all costs associated with the podcast are generously supported by listeners through the Patreon. So if you think the episode you're about to listen to is worth a couple of bucks, it would be great to have them. And I'm genuinely grateful for anyone who does support the show through Patreon, you are you are legitimately making it possible for me to do this and to continue providing this content for free and advertisement free to thousands and thousands of people. So you're awesome. Thank you for that. And thank you also to anyone who helps get the show out there or has been helping to get my book out there by sharing or leaving reviews or anything like that. You're terrific. Thank you so much. Apart from that, let's get straight to this. Um, this is Consciousness and Morality with Jack Symes.
Okay, um, I am joined today by Jack. Welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. It's great to be here, Toby. It's a long time since we've spoken. Um, yeah, it's good to see you looking well. Yeah, so we reached out, we chatted when I was starting my podcast, mm-hmm. which was, that's got to be four, four years ago now, something like that. Is that how long it's been? Yeah, you reached out just to say you were starting your, your podcast and yeah, just to get the get the inside scoop, eh? and it's went really well for you. Congratulations! Um, it's great to see all the successes you've had. Yeah, thank you. How long? Have, remind me again. How long have you? If you've been doing this a fair bit longer than me, how long have you been doing? It? Not too much longer, actually. The, we started the Pan Sidecast maybe five and a half years ago now. The, mm-hmm. the start of two thousand and sixteen, we started the project, and it was probably around August we released our first episode after re-recording that first episode about three or four times. <laughs> Well, by way of introduction, do you want to um, mm-hmm. maybe say a few words just about, because your podcast led to the book that we're going to discuss, so do you want to maybe start with yeah. a few words about the podcast? Yeah, so the podcast uh, is called the Pan Psychast Philosophy Podcast. We've been going, like I say, for about five and a half years. It's now a bi-weekly show. We used to do a weekly show. Uh, we're supported by our patrons, um, been supported at the moment by University of Liverpool and the University of Birmingham's Global Philosophy Religion Project as well. So we've been able to collaborate with some really great organizations lately. But the show, like in essence, is myself, my co-hosts, Andrew Horton and Oliver Marley, two very good friends of mine who mm-hmm. we started the, the podcast out with. I mean, the podcast starts out in those early episodes, us not really knowing a lot, just trying to enjoy it, have a laugh and not take it all too seriously. And then as we've grown and grown in popularity and built this audience, we started to have some of leading philosophers on the show and and do a lot more research for our episodes. So mm-hmm. it's became really a rod for our own back, um, but we still really, really enjoy it. So we do roundtable discussions, mm-hmm. you know, seminars which are fun and engaging and everyone's done the reading and no one's having a panic attack. Mm-hmm. And then we do the interviews with the philosophers as well. So, yeah, I mean, I really, really enjoy it. And it's great, as you know, to just get to sit down and and talk about these ideas and and, and speak to people who you know, are at the, the forefront of research in the topic. So, and we hopefully get to talk about some of them today. Yeah, it, it's great, isn't it? I mean, we'll get on to this, but like, it's in theory like a really like, oh, what is public philosophy? What are your goals mm. here? What are you trying to do? And, and those are, you know, like I say, we'll get to that. But I think for me, one reason is because it's fun. I enjoy it. Yeah. Like, it can be, as we were discussing, there's a certain amount to get right with, like, how to technically record your episode, yeah. booking guests and getting on everyone's schedules can be a bit of a faff. Um, like, it's a lot of work, but, like, the bottom line is I love talking to people. Um, yeah. For the most part, I love the audience reaction. Occasionally someone's a bit mean, but actually that's a really <laughs> small minority of the time. How often are people mean? What got... <laughs> I think, well, and how well, mean are they? Well, I'm more political than you. So like, okay. well, I don't know. I haven't listened to everything. I've listened to your show. No, our worst reviews are political philosophy ones. So I'm, I, I sympathise with you there. Yeah, I actually don't. I actually don't mind. I try to practice what I preach here, and I try mm-hmm. to preach a equitable bipartisan thickening of skins. Um, so yeah. I think the demand for thick skins can often come from people who occupy a certain amount of societal privilege and are not willing to put that burden on themselves. They're very willing to say, yeah. social justice warriors, you need to, 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 to get used to robust criticism. But if someone wants to make a claim that they're being discriminatory, say, mm. then they'll run crying for the hills. Whereas I don't, but I don't think it's wrong in principle. I think you should be open to robust criticism. And I think if someone just says something like hysterically unpleasant you just kind of laugh and move on with your day like yeah i, I think the negative reviews are, are the funniest they they stand out as the ones we we talk about quite often the favorite review which is negative of ours was when we did our four-part series on Marx, and someone put like they did this series on Marx, and they did all the reading and stuff mm-hmm. and at the very end they decided they didn't want marxism to come into being because they didn't want to lose any of their cool stuff <laughs> i was like <laughs> Brilliant. I that's think that's exactly literally well. like one of the main reasons that's why people exactly don't want what it. Is. <laughs> and the other one was uh, we did an interview with Grace Blakely, and you know, sometimes we don't challenge the guests perhaps as much as we'd 
we'd like to when it's online like this and when they've got such a big thesis of their book and they're unpacking their ideas. And they essentially said like, oh, you just gave this person a platform to spread their lefty ideology. You didn't challenge them enough. And yeah, perhaps uh, there's a grain of truth in it. It's, it's, um, it allows us to, to reflect on what to do better in the future. Yeah. I mean, some, sometimes there's critiques that um, are, you know, they might be a bit mean, but there's something there you can learn from. Um, sometimes yeah. there's ones that are just unhinged. Um, <laughs> okay, I've got a great one. This was just a few weeks ago. Um, I'm not going to get the quote right, but it was beautiful. It was something like, this person, instead of going to therapy, this person threw themselves <laughs> into the lucid hell that is neo-Republican <laughs> ideology. It's like fucking poetry. That's really funny. Like, That's great. <laughs> um, but to your point, I think... It's always just going to be a bit of a judgment call how much you challenge someone and how much you bring yeah. your own views into it. And I mm -hmm. think where I've landed is that there just isn't a right way of doing this. I do challenge people. I, I hope mm -hmm. nicely and politely, but I do challenge people. I do give my own views. But the sort of flip side to that is you risk making the interview all about you. And you yeah. risk, you know, people who've come on to hear this interesting person and they're like, well, who's this guy prattling on all over them and i'm aware mm. of that danger um and i think at the end of the day my style is a conversation is a back and forth yep. other people's style might be more um just like questions or somewhere in between and i mm. think it kind of really depends what you're after like yeah they're just different things and i don't think it has to be all one or the other i think there's definitely room in the world for interviewers, you know, you know, on the one side, you maybe got like your Jeremy Paxman's or something. And then on the other, mm. you've got like a Charlie Rose. Yeah, I, th I think they're both valid. I don't think it, it anyway, it has to be like, there's a right way to interview. Maybe. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Broadly, maybe this is a bit naive. But when we're doing philosophy in particular, that platonic dialogue and something which is present in both of our books that are coming out or podcasting more generally is it allows you to to, you know, to have that conversation to develop those ideas in a more natural way like when we have conversations with people in general out and out and about in the real world you don't give them those paxman nigel warburton type like punchy questions which is like a sentence or two right you you want to feel like you're in the center of this conversation that's that's developing and and that's new and fresh and could go in these various directions. Personally, I, I don't find the question, long answer, question, long answer, um, dynamic, particularly engaging at all. I, I can find that I can turn off very, very quickly to that. It has to be, as you say, someone I'm particularly interested in hearing the views of. So, you know, you might have Rutger Bregman, like we had on, on the show, your listeners would be familiar with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, People are interested in Utopia for Realists. People are interested in his book, Humankind. So, yeah, we want to hear what Rucker Brennan has to say. We don't want to hear what Jack, Andy, and Ollie or, or Toby have to say on this, right? Like, they, they're they not the best-selling author on this topic. Let's hear about from the expert. But most people, I think, who are listening to the pan cast, and I wonder if this is true of the Political Philosophy podcast, is I think they come back because they feel like a connection, a community with, with the podcast and the hosts. They they like you and like they they engage with your personality and that's why you go back to it. I know that's true for me and the podcasts and things that I listen to. Um, no, my experience is very, very similar. Um, mm. And I think I probably talk even more than you. Um, you think so? <laughs> yeah. Um, this is going to be interesting. This could go on for three or four yeah, hours. So, so I, I definitely agree with you um, in, in everything you just said. And that's certainly how I approach doing public philosophy. And I think, I think look, there's a reason that um, podcasting has really become... I mean, it, it, it's sprung up everywhere, but it's really become prevalent within certain mm -hmm. disciplines, and philosophy is one of them, right? And I think there's, there are reasons for that, and it's probably something quite like what you sketched out. And also, I think 
even irrespective of the utility of it, I think philosophers in their mind's eye, perhaps in private, do have an image of themselves as like Socrates holding forth with the young <laughs> of Athens, you know? Um, yeah. I think even us podcasters can, can fall victim to that. I say only... Um, I'm, I'm being sort of ecumenical with the other, other approaches to interviewing because mm. I do get criticism sometimes that are like, well, my God, Toby loves the sound of his own voice. And it can sometimes be a bit meanly phrased. But I, like I say, mm. I try to practice a sort of equitable thickening of skins. Um, and so I just sort of think, is there anything to this? And like, yeah, maybe, I think, is where I land with that. Like, maybe sometimes someone really is just tuning in to hear the other person and they're not yeah. interested in me. Sometimes maybe I'm like cutting someone off in the middle of an interesting point. I think mm. definitely a lot of the time, um, the sort of editorialising I'm doing, I could have accomplished in a few sentences what it's taken me a few paragraphs to do. Yeah. So, like, I, th I think there's validity to it. Um, so I'm definitely, I have my style, and I prefer mm -hmm. my style. And in fairness to myself, I, you know, I do have an audience who seems to sort of like the way I do things. Um, it's uh, the, the comments I'm talking about you know, are a minority. Um, but I I don't want to... I guess when I'm saying there's just different styles, I'm, I'm, I'm more just saying I'm not dismissing the, the sorts of critiques people would give of my interviewing style as mm. completely invalid. I can see yeah. that different audiences might want different things. And to which I guess at the end of the day, I would just say, you know, I'm mindful I'll try and prep my interviews and not go on longer than I need to. Um, but at the same time, then, you know, that maybe another show, maybe something more like Mac Techman's Elucidations, which is more mm. of a traditional interview. And Matt's a good friend and it's a very good show. I, ju I just did Elucidations. Maybe that's sort of more like what you're looking for. Um, mm. And maybe, and I, I, I welcome any new listeners, but, you know, maybe this just isn't sort of the style that would appeal to you, and that's fine. You know, like, there's different yeah. styles for different people, so it's more sort of a, like... It's not that I don't like my style better, I do. It's more I don't want to completely dismiss critics, you know? Anyway. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting reflection. I suppose it comes down to, like, those underlying principles, that vision you have for what your show is, mm. is supposed to be about, and me, Ollie, and Andy are all like teachers by trade. Mm -hmm. And so we know the type of lessons that get more people like involved and engaged with. And it's not the ones where we're just like talking from the front or where you just like direct questions at a few people or, and things like that. It's ones in a philosophy classroom, at least, where everyone's engaging with the ideas and contributing to them. And when we have a, like a, we do a recording for the Pan Psycast, we'll spend a lot, most of the time off microphone, just planning like, you let's not you don't go on for too long here and make sure that someone jumps in there and if if we're as we're recording and someone hasn't spoke for a while we're both pointing at them like you need to jump in now because we want hmm. these voices to be bouncing around back and forth and for, for the actual podcast but like you say i mean p people who are looking for the guests ideas hmm. certainly it's better suited like that classic question answer question answer and what's really interesting i think about you know, your book, What is Freedom, or uh, My Philosophers on Consciousness, is that you can tailor that even more, right? You can fine-tune what you think is going to be the, the perfect conversation. And I think there's a, there's a, I guess, a beauty, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. or certainly a, a skill to it, uh, pedagogically at least, that I underappreciated beforehand. I love the natural flowing conversation of podcasting or, or classrooms and and I mean, there is a reason on the page is right, great. that so many classic works of philosophy are written in dialogue form. Because mm. it's like, I don't think, well, pff, people might disagree, I don't think there ever was an actual conversation that was the, the dialogue of Plato's Republic or the Gorgas or whatever. I think that's a literary construct, right? Mm. Um, so, like, it's not like, oh my god, I remember word for word this effing like 27 hour conversation Socrates had one time <laughs> no it's like it maybe incorporates some ideas from the historic Socrates yeah. and I think even that's a bit dubious 
Um, but no, he has ideas, and this is the way he's chosen to express them. Um, same with mm-hmm. Cicero, same with, you know, blah, 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 blah. There, there's a reason for that, right? Yeah. No, I, I think so. But it, it certainly has... It just, it's engaging, right? Yeah. We just did an episode with uh, Vid Simoniti from here at Liverpool on uh, the art as political discourse, and the value that art can have in terms of conveying philosophical ideas and, and doing so in a way that isn't like this shadowy, drunk offspring of the objective like treaties of philosophy, but it can actually give you an insight into, into these treaties. It can give you knowledge. And I think, for me at least, when I was a, like a, before I was like 18 or 21 even, like I wasn't particularly interested in platonic dialogues. Mm-hmm. They, they weren't engaging. I didn't, I'd rather watch, engage with multimedia, mm-hmm. rather have the conversations firsthand. But I suppose as I've, I've grown a little bit, older and perhaps wiser or dumber reading them back uh, when we did our series on like the last days of socrates that's we had so much fun doing that we plato wrote out the... is so much fun I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. i've never done an episode on plato oh it's uh it's fantastic we we've done quite a, a fair few now but we we wrote out the dialogues again and then made them our own and had running jokes and stuff in there and just like added like a little bit of mm. humor to it and i think that uh, we we absolutely loved them that was around the time of first writing this uh this book so the the dialogue format's very much taken over so talking of the book mm. it's beautiful video. look at that. i haven't got my copy yet Toby. this you is have such yours. a tragedy that i have the i legitimately feel for you because um i've got both of us here in fact um oh very nice um but um all of the contributors and whatnot got their copies of my book before I did. And I had to wait like another... Uh, OUP. I had to wait like another two weeks. And I was like... I know it's like a little thing and like... It, you know, I already know what's in it, right? But like... <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's like my thing. I've spent hundreds of hours on this. I, I've even spent a lot of time on like the freaking cover art. I want my book. You know, it's just like this childish, like I want yeah. my toys. You know? So I really feel yeah. for you there, mate. No, I, I mean, I, it's it's weird because I'm doing like a, a like a mini little book tour thing, like like interviews like this to to promote it, and hmm. I'm finding myself having to use like my proof PDFs, like the, the original documents that I wrote it up on, because I don't have like a book to read through and do my notes. And, hmm. So I don't think I've re- it'd be really useful actually to to have one. But no, did what what did you think? And, and I wonder like uh, the comparisons with with your own book and okay, and you because want... I imagine they're quite similar. I haven't seen. I haven't seen either of them in physical form, so this is perhaps best for you, for you to answer. You you want my like book review of this because I've read this. Li- I I only just got it a few days ago, so I've got I read. <laughs> I read this last night. It's not a long book. So oh, I, I was oh, able great. to to read it, um, but not like a detailed read. Yeah, and I should say, you know, well, okay. So here's what I like about this book. This is something that I was able to pick up cover to cover in I mean a few hours really um, mm. I'm quite a fast reader and like if I wanted to do like the details I'd have to go back and slow down um, and I think it does really what it sets out to do which is give you a sort of nice overview of some of the big ideas in the philosophy of consciousness because this is I'll admit this is not my area at all um, yeah, you haven't done it since you were an undergraduate, I think you said in an earlier conversation. Yeah, that. so I have done classes on this, but like more than a decade ago. And yeah. very much, not only am I in the political philosophy realm, I'd say honestly, more accurately, it should be called the political theory podcast. But there already mm. is something called that, and <laughs> the political philosophy, there isn't. So I, 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 I've... Not only been more on the moral and political philosophy side, I've mm. much more um, over the four years I've done it gravitated towards um, theorizing practice rather than right. like ideal models. Um, but anyway, so this isn't something I know, but it it was very accessible, very engaging, and it it was really nice. Sort of like just coming from, like, a loose general knowledge of, like, oh, yeah, I know that, and I know about, like, the hard problem of consciousness and zombies and so on, and just be brought back up to speed with it. Mm. What I thought was interesting, and this isn't... 
It's more an observation than either a criticism or praise, um, but it follows really neatly out of from what we've just talking about it, is you, I got the feeling, you have a very strong editorial voice in this volume. Mm. And that's something that I really wrestled with with mine as well, which mm -hmm. is like, you know, I... I never actually got this criticism, but I anticipated it of my book, which is, I, people wouldn't say it in this way to you, but people might say to me, your political biases are showing, essentially. Mm. Like, this is an ideological project, you are clearly coming from a liberal perspective, and yeah. you're clearly unhappy with many of the libertarian and conservative ideals of freedom that are ascendant in our society. And mm. you're more than that. You clearly have an ideological project for the left, which is a leftism built on freedom as opposed to equality or justice, right? Um, and you're not just neutrally presenting us with 12 scholars, which we can pursue on our own. In your mm -hmm. selection of scholars and how you've structured it, um, you have an agenda, to which I would say, mm -hmm. yes, no, I'm glad you understood the book. Um, and um, it was it was like a balancing act, though, because on the one side, I don't think there's a view from nowhere. I don't think there's a place of pure objectivity where you just say these, are, by selecting 12 people to put in, you've made a value judgment as to who is yeah. worth your audience hearing. Um, and it's like, just how far down that road are you willing to travel? And I think, mm. if anything, you've travelled... I, I was willing to travel quite a way down that road, and I think, if anything, you've travelled even further, because you end with, like, OK, this is where we've got to, and honestly... You, OK, so I'm going to summarise your ending. You say there's been a few hundred years of this debate, and, you know, honestly, we made a wrong turn way back when... <laughs> And so I'm just now going to discard a lot of this and give you what I think is really going on. Even that, even I wasn't that that editorially bold. <laughs> so that's uh, that's a really nice reflection, thank you. I I think, and this is uh, I've said this this elsewhere that I I don't have a bias towards any of the the views in the book per se. Like boring old physicalism, like. The world is as it is described by physical science. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a fan of that view, hmm. or the Mysterians view that says consciousness. You're never going to get your head around it. We can never answer the problem. I'm not too sympathetic to to that view either. But the views that are presented in philosophers on consciousness, and I should just say, like, because for, for, this is obviously political philosophy, just here the question of philosophers on consciousness is the hard problem, and and some listeners will be aware of it. But it goes something like this. Yeah, it's been why okay. doesn't all your brain processing go on in the dark like when images go into your computer like when your webcams has uh, visual inputs and your microphone has audio inputs and when you bash the keys on the keyboard he doesn't feel those things and see those things and hear those things but when visual and toby and my camera go into my webcam and audio goes into my microphones and when people bash the keys on my keyboard i feel them my brain processing doesn't go on in the dark. There's something it's like to be me. So the question of the book is, why is that? And how does that come about? Particularly if the world is as it is described by physical science. So what the book tries to do, I, I think it, it does do this, is that it takes like the leading thoughts from the leading philosophers and the contemporary debate and makes that accessible and engaging and puts them against one another and in conversation with each other. So the selection of the people in the book was very much, well, who do we need? Who are the best people in these particular fields representing these views? And how can we tailor that and, and like stream that into that, like that journey, that like um, exploration of the idea? So it does start off with like, why should we even care about this topic? And I think Greg does a really good job in that first chapter of that. Susan Blackmore and David Chalmers, you know, they talk about the nature of consciousness and the problem. But Frank Jackson and Michelle Montague talking about like experience as well and the nature of experience. And then we get into the big clash between those that say, oh, the hard problem isn't that hard. People mm -hmm. like um, Smoky Lucci and Pat Churchland. Then we get the illusionists who say it's just a physical trick of the brain, like mm -hmm. Keith Frankish, Dan Dennett. And then, as you say, the book ends with, 
panpsychism or physicalism, as Galen Strawson would call it, and Goff goes heavy on the panpsychism. And at the end, yeah, Miri Bihari and I say, oh, maybe there isn't any such thing as physical stuff and it's all might. But that's not my view. Like, I don't have a, I'm happy and sympathetic to all of them. I'm, we spoke about Socrates a little, little mm-hmm. while ago. I just, yeah, I guess I have fell victim to that. But the, the point of the book is to get people thinking about the questions. It's supposed to be like a, in my mind, it's how can this appeal to lots of people? How can I differentiate it to be engaging for a student who's 15 or someone who's in their, in their 60s who's been studying this all their life? And I think there's something in there for both of them. But the point of the final chapter isn't to be like, and it's, here's what's right. Yeah, it's supposed to be provocative. It's mm. the kind of thing I would say in a class or on a podcast to inspire some conversation on it. If the book ended with a uncontroversial, dry solution to the problem mm. of consciousness, my students and I wouldn't go around like, I wouldn't be left with that sense of awe, that sense of like, or controversy or, or want to be discussing it. And so I think the book you, ends in a naturally you find conversation the, you starting find place. The solution you propose to be elegant. You find that it covers yeah. covers the gaps and the arguments to a degree yeah, that but... you find coherent and plausible. I'm not saying you're yeah, insisting. I, that I see that right. with the other views as well. Yeah, mm. like I suppose like illusionism and everything else too. I see how that could provide a solution. I think that is an an elegant solution to mm. the the problem of the hard problem, but. Um, I, I could have easily just if if Keith Frankish had said to me like, do you want to co-write this this essay with me? I would have said yeah, and that mm. that could have been the the one that my name was on. But it just so happened that uh, Miri and I got on really well, and and that um, we we had great fun putting together the the final chapter. There's also a strong pedagogical pedi- educational. I knew there was a real word at the bottom yeah. of that. Um, there's also quite a strong educational element to your book. I think probably more so than mine. Um, yeah. Like, you sort of, I'll, I'll show the audience this, you've got quite a lot of, like, let me just find a good page for this, like, little um, text inserts, just, like, clarifying yeah. key terms and key figures. I think you've sort of geared this a lot, like, anyone can read it, but I think you've also, like, had an eye for, like, if an A-level student picked this up, yeah. would this be useful? Is that right? Yeah, I think the info box is a a really interesting concept because you do typically find them in textbooks and things like that. But I thought, why not bring them into a book for for the general public? Because if we want to, essentially, if someone's picking up this book, they want to learn about the hard problem of consciousness and we want it to be engaging for everyone. So if you didn't, if you already know about the field, you just read the main text, right? Hmm. But if you're new to it, then you've, you can just look over to the side and, oh, I didn't know who that person, that concept was, or like even like Frank Jackson's chapter gets a little bit technical at one point. So it's mm. like, okay, well, if you weren't following that, here's what he's saying. And that's you know, that's like teaching 101, right? And that, But something which is really hard to do on a podcast per se. You, when you're in a classroom or when, you, when you're teaching, you can give a certain student some extra resources or go over to them and have that conversation with them, right? Mm. Oh, I saw you were looking at me really confused there when I said zombie. Like, I wasn't talking about something that's going to eat your mum. I was talking about this philosophical creature. And, mm. and so it's essentially like that. It brings the whole uh, the whole class or the whole audience with you along. And it also gives an opportunity to add like a little bit of, little bit of humor or a little bit of... Um, a, a different dynamic to keep it fresh when you're going through perhaps something which is a little bit more challenging. What led to consciousness as the the subject? Because you've you've got quite a few episodes of the podcast out. Mm. I assume you could have found like a, cent- a, a there'd have been a few different candidates for central organizing yeah. concept. What what led to? I mean, maybe it was just sort it's of an organic conscious. process, but but what led to this as opposed to? Um, I don't know, you've had a fair amount on, like, religion. You could have picked something yeah. there as well. So what, what led to this? Well, it's the first book in a in what will be a, a series of books. The next one's going to be Philosophers on God talking about morality. Oh, okay. so that's, and then after that's that, coming. Philosophers on uh, how to live talking about morality. Um, so they, they are coming. They're working on the second and the third ones at the moment, and, and we'll go from there. I was planning some on political philosophy as, as well in the future. And 
so the, the consciousness one felt like one which is very of the time people are really interested in the questions that being in the world of academic philosophy or teaching students of, of philosophy so many people are interested in in the ideas and yeah it's been an interest of mine for a, a long time i mean the podcast is called the pan Psycast, which is actually supposed to mean like casting thoughts everywhere yeah. something like that but a lot of people when you introduce them even now say hey, this is a podcast about pan psychism you know like i'm doing like political philosophy or something like, mm-hmm. no it's just the just the name so i'm just really i just been a long interest of mine for a while and i think it captures the first one of the most important philosophical questions because it it grounds like meaning it grounds moral value it grounds our fundamental understanding of reality and it's not alienating to people in the way that some other topics can be Hmm. so the question of god for example you need to really sell to someone why they should care about that because you could be you could be quite dismissive of the topic Hmm. um from from the get-go but with consciousness like it's so intimate for everybody right it, it's everything they love is captured in this concept literally and everything they hate is captured in it too so it seemed like a, a really great place to, to start and start mapping out uh, our understanding of the world do you think the hard problem is sort of like that's the the fonset origa here that's the start that's like the the central place where that's the first question that, that like the paths lead out from in terms of philosophy more generally no, like I, that's I, the... I mean I, my view is philosophy is kind of an umbrella term that covers a few different yeah. things but for the philosophy of consciousness it's like mm. the the hard problem is the thing we're here for essentially I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't thought I mean, about... I don't know. This isn't my field at that's all. That's too much. My, my intuition, my knee-jerk, is that they... You see, philosophy is this big web, this big map of all these mm-hmm. ideas, and, and like consciousness and the, and the hard problem is so intimately connected with all these other things that if you ripped it out, then philosophy would maybe even bleed out but, entirely. But, but just for the philosophy of consciousness, like the hard just for problem, philosophy of consciousness. the hard problem yeah. is really, really central to that. Yeah, it... it uh, Definitely, I think that's it's 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 the question which we're bothered about more than any of the others, right? That's the big gaping hole in our understanding of the world and the scientific picture of the world. Um, but you could, someone like Keith Frankish or Massimo Pellucci in the book say, well, actually the problem is why do we think the things we do about consciousness? The meta problem. If you can explain why we think mm. we've got these uh, qualia or uh, this, this non-physical aspect to our to our quote-unquote minds then then the hard problem would disappear and Pilucci says as well like let's let's look at evolutionary biology let's look at its function and uh, Pat Church and some listeners will know tries to make us think it's less of a significant problem than perhaps we're articulating in philosophy so there's some people who would disagree and say the hard problem isn't that hard or the hard problem isn't the problem we should be focused on. But I think you're right in this sense. They all tie back, all the rows lead back to, Mm. uh, should we take the hard problem seriously? Mm. Is there a solution to the hard problem? And and I think that's the thing we're getting our teeth into. I... I I have... I bring nothing more than intuitions to this, because, like I say, this is not my, my, my field. Although, although... As a moral consequentialist, I have to give mm. some account of consciousness in my theory, I think. Because what... I, I, I think... I don't think the, the best account of moral consequentialism is like a pure bent to my pleasure minus pain. I think mm. pleasure and pain are important, and just like sheer pain avoidance is like actually kind of underrated. But what, what you're sort of saying is like states of conscious experience, something mm. like that. So, like you talked what about, what did you make way. of that in in the book? What did you make of this? The so I before mm. like interviewing Dave Chalmers, I think I was probably a, a hedonistic utilitarian, mm. maximize pleasure, minimize pain. He gives that example in the book of the Vulcan trolley problem, doesn't he? Where he says, imagine you've got one normal human being mm. who experiences pleasure, pain, happiness, suffering, or has the capacity to. do and on the other track, you've got five Vulcans, mm. these creatures that are conscious, 
but don't have experiences of pain, pleasure, suffering, and, and happiness. And he asks which one would save out of the one the fire. Do you have any intuitions on what so, you do? I haven't worked through that particular problem. I, I wonder if I could take a slightly parallel problem, um, mm. or as I, I see it as analogous, which would be utility monsters. Yeah. Um, but, but I think they're, they're tracking to a similar thing, which is if what's valuable is sort of conscious experiences and good ones right. rather than bad ones, where do we stand morally with respect to beings that experience consciousness very differently to us, right? Mm. So the Vulcans, on the one hand, sort of don't have the things that mm -hmm. we like think might be valuable or not valuable, and then the utility monster simply has far, far more of them, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to lose a lot of people here. I, <laughs> I bite this bullet. Um, if we lived in a universe where beings like that exist, we would be mm -hmm. in a, a very, very different moral reality. Um, beings like utility monsters or beings like Vulcans? Either or. Like, the, the nature of our moral responsibility would radically change in either of those universes. Um, and I can do Utility Monster just because I've thought through a bit more what that universe would look like. I'd have, yeah. to, I'd have to start from scratch with the Vulcans. Um, if we lived in a world that had a Utility Monster we would be living in a moral universe something a bit like what's captured in the Pentateuch of Old Testament, which is to say, I don't think in the Old Testament you've got this pure, omnipotent, omnipresent thing. I think that's a more modern construction of God. But you nonetheless mm -hmm. have a being whose wills and desires matter far, far more than yours, and that yours are simply in. in insignificant in comparison to yeah. us. And there's sort of a fear element, there's like, you know, we do what God says because otherwise hailstorms or whatever. But there's also just, I think, a recognition that this is a much sort of, it's a utility monster in many senses, right? This is a being whose sort of existence, they're not using this language at all, but whose like existence, whose needs, whose capacities are beyond what mm. we could understand and um, they just not only take priority over ours, but just override ours straightforwardly. And I think if utility monsters existed, we would be mm. living in a universe that, that looks something like a theistic universe. I, okay. I'm not sure about the, the last bit. I mean, I'm, I'm happy for you to bite the bullet. Like... I don't know, like, the, the utility monster, if I remember correctly, just has intense or loads of head-ons of pleasure mm. from things which, for us, like, we feel like we're suffering, but, like, the monster could eat me and get so much pleasure from that that it would justify the eating of me or the eating mm. of lots of people because it's it's pleasure what, what matters for the, the calculus. I mean, like, when, we, when I spoke to Peter Singer about this and put it forward to him, he said, yeah, something similar, like, this is a silly, you put it less politely than you. This is a silly thought experiment. It's not something which we need to be concerned about. It's not something that's that's in the world. But what about like a great, big, like alien being, this big creature who eats us like a Malteser, like he just chucks planet Earth in its mouth in a second, in the same way that we might throw like a, a bit of animal flesh and non-human animal flesh in our mouth. So yeah, it tastes great. Like. And I'm this great big being who creates all this, all these positive pleasure head-ons. That that might not be what's in our universe, right? But it's it's certainly conceivable, like within the the laws of nature which we find ourselves in. Or maybe that's a little bit. That no, sounds no, no. a little bit um, wacky. When so, I so no, that. this is this is a good topic to pursue because um, this is a dialogue we can both have. Because if we're doing more like pure the heart problem, I'm more going to be yeah. asking you questions. Whereas this is one. I can, I, I believe myself capable of weighing in on um, how justifiably is another question, but okay. <laughs> um, I think there's a few points I want to make with respect to this. Um, and, and, and I think a lot of these are just going to be clarifying what I see mm. as the best version of um, moral consequentialism. 
Um, the first one is, I, I, I will sort of reiterate uh, Peter Singer's point, if you ask a silly question, you get a silly answer. But I think more specifically, if you assume a um, radically unlikely and radically counterintuitive setup of the world, then mm. the ways in which morality will operate in that world will also be very distant from our own and very, very counterintuitive to us. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that as like a crazy thought. So to just give an example, I was talking about this last night with my wife. Um, I think the types of political morality, it came out of, I'm going to bring this back, a documentary about they think they finally worked out who uh, betrayed the Anne Frank family and turned them yeah, in. Yeah, saw that, yeah. Um, and it turns out it was another Jew who was essentially mm. trying to save their own family. And so, okay, here's, here's where I'm going with that. Um, I think the types of moral obligations you have under democracy and under sort of a hardcore authoritarianism are probably very different because mm -hmm. we all like to think, oh, I would be the guy who would risk my own life to save others. And maybe you would be, but what if it's your children's lives? That's that's a little bit different, right? What if it's not just you'd be risking your children's lives, it is certain death for your children unless you cooperate with this regime. Um, mm. I am sympathetic to the argument that at least on for individuals, the nature of your moral obligation there has radically shifted. And mm -hmm. if you take that conclusion in itself, you sound monstrous, right? If you say, I am not unsympathetic to someone who felt he was justified in turning Anne Frank in. Just in isolation, you yeah. sound like just the worst person in the world, right? But uh -huh. actually, if that person, let's just say this is the account, was doing it to save his own family, I am not unsympathetic to that person. And which is to say that in a radically different situation, the, the, the morality has become radically different. And we don't have to be neutral between those situations. We, we, we might be and should be very thankful that we don't live in a, a, a world where, however unjust it can be, we are not facing choices like that. Mm. We might be thankful that we don't live in a world with utility monsters or Vulcans or all sorts of other things, right? <laughs> um, that just doesn't really change the fact that in 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 very different worlds mm. different rules would be operative i'll make i'll make one more point and i'll do it quickly and then I'll, I'll let you get back in um i think there's another thing whereby i think consequentialism to some degree fairly to some degree unfairly has sort of been forever shackled to bentham's calculus where he right. just assumed it's like one dial you can turn up and down and the sort of thought of the utility monster is what if you just had a thought and you what if you just dialed that all the way up to the top, right? Mm. And then they perhaps the thought of the Vulcans is if you just turned it all the way down the other way, right? Mm. Whereas I think what I'd want to put forward is um, a more sort of pluralistic conception of the good and that there's different things people find. I'd sort of want to go to, like, higher and lower pleasures and just sort of keep going in that direction. I don't think it's one category jump. I think there's lots of different things, and they reconcile and trade off against each other in pretty complex ways, and I don't think we have a full map of it. Um, so I think if you were trying to postulate a being whose consciousness would just matter that much more than ours. It's not just like they'd really just have the most pleasure and the most hedons. I think it's like, you know, you'd have Einstein's and Shakespeare's minds as tiny parts of a massive web that included all of the most elevated thoughts humanity's ever had as well as the baser pleasures, as well as a whole load of stuff of which we can't even imagine. Like I say, mm -hmm. I think you'd be getting a bit towards something like how people conceptualise gods. Um, so I'll stop, I'll stop there, but that's like how I begin to start unpacking that question. Yeah, okay. I think we've, there's, lots, there's lots in there, right? I think yeah. there's two core things which are, they're in there that are eager to, to separate from yeah. one another. The first is 
as you say, perhaps the distinction between moral blameworthiness and what's morally right and wrong. So take it goes right the way back to Confucius, doesn't it? When it's what happens in the Analects, someone it's it's someone's dad like steals a goat or a sheep or something from another farm and he comes back and the son's like, Dad, where do you get this fucking goat from? He's like, I stole it, it's just what I do. <laughs> He's just like, What? And then Confucius asks his students, you know, if your dad stole a goat, would you grass him into the farmer? Or would you say, you know, don't do that again, Dad, give him a soft word and and, and not take any like uh, legal action against him? You see it and same with like Euthyphro as well, don't we talk about Plato earlier? And Euthyphro is like, yeah, I'm going to take my dad to court. Like, he killed this slave. He's a bad man. And it's just, it's what the gods want me to do. And people aren't happy with Euthyphro as he tells Socrates because it's his family. It seems like morality shifted there. And then the same rules don't apply to uh, to our Kim. I'm not too sure about that question personally. Um, When, again, following singer here he he says when there's the drowning child in, in the mm. pond and your your mum or your perhaps your child's next to this random child you can't blame the person for saving their own family um, i'm not sure how far that gets you more uh in terms of like um morally speaking mm. uh, it seems like more of like a a principle that you could apply like pragmatically right don't be mean to this person for doing that thing, but maybe morality itself is, is still at play and it's still wrong to save one over the other for, for something arbitrary, like being a family member. Anyway, I'm not committed to any view mm. on that. I think the, the interesting question for me is the Vulcan, like you say there, I, I want to refrain from, I like the like the analogy of having this, this uh, hedonic uh, calculus dial and have you have you ever read? I'm sure you have Bentham's poem on uh, the hedonic calculus. I, I might not have done. No, um, Toby, it's so funny. Okay, it's, it's absolutely hilarious. We'll see if I can uh, dig it out before before the end of our interview. It's, it's great that he thought it would be. Uh, it'd be. I can't get through it with a straight face. Anyway, it gives us a poem so we can easily remember hmm. the uh, the the things that go into the dial, the things that are relevant. But I don't want to say the Vulcans on that dial i would say the vulcans like a hedonistic like they're they're not on the spectrum Mm. of pleasure and pain suffering and happiness they're not all the way down they just don't have that capacity Mm. it would be as if you were to say that escalator like is a good listener Mm. or that number is smelly what are you on about toby like what you what you doing? What are you drinking there? But they have conscious experience. They have good. They have conscious experience, but they don't have any capacity for feeling pleasure, pain, happiness, or suffering. They're consciously neutral in okay. all of their states. I think I'm formulating in real time a bit of a better answer to the Vulcan question then, which is the conception of what we're trying to maximize in terms of conscious experience that i'd push for is a lot broader than pleasure minus pain um that there's and in fact if you stripped out everything that i think is either valuable or non-valuable from consciousness you would be left with very little um Mm. and that what you would probably have because, like, I think, like, abstract thought, for instance, might be, like, an intrinsically valuable thing. I don't have a detailed mm-hmm. account of that. But um, I think, like, the... God knows. The ability to, like, work through in your head an interesting chess problem. Independent right. of the consequence... Independent of whether that, like, helps someone or hurts someone, that in itself mm. might be a valuable conscious experience, right? Right. So if you stripped everything that I'm saying is valuable out of a conscious creature, I Mm. I, I think you'd kind of be left with, not a zombie, but something shambling towards that. And by that point, then, yeah, maybe we wouldn't have moral obligations towards that creature. But, sorry, I think I've misunderstood that, Ben. Weren't you just saying there are, it's intrinsically valuable to work out a problem in a neutral state? That's something great in and of itself. Quite possibly, yeah. Um, and if it does have, if it is a great making property, 
and we value it mm -hmm. and we think it has some kind of worth. So Nelson Pike in the philosophy of religion has the great making property game where he says, hey, we've got two doors mm -hmm. and behind each door is a mystery object. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you one thing about it. And you've got to choose which one to save, which one to destroy. So he says conscious door or non-conscious door. And the person says, I'm going to save for this is a participatory mm -hmm. game, Toby. You can't just you have to save the conscious thing or the non-conscious thing. Which okay, one do you so save? We, we go with conscious thing. Powerful or stupid? Ambivalent. Oh, sorry. I just said powerful or stupid. I meant powerful or weak. <laughs> weak. You'd save the weak thing? Possibly, yeah. Really? I'd have to justify that answer. I'm just going <laughs> yeah, off my gut here. So, so most uh, theists say like you'd save the clever thing, you'd save the powerful thing, you'd save the good thing. Those are intrinsic, great-making properties. They're good for the sake of themselves, hmm. not for the sake of the object or entity that has them, or not for the sake of others. So if you think that Vulcans have intrinsic greatness, you, maybe that's connected somewhat with moral value. And if it is, then perhaps you need to extend your the boundaries yeah, but of I, I, I think, our agent beyond the, I think the claim the I'm, the, I think the claim I'm making it, it doesn't commit me to go down that road um I, when, when I say I think let's just say solving an interesting chess problem um mm -hmm. another way I can do that is I can cover that just by expanding my definition of happiness right I can just say my definition of happiness such that the conscious experience of like, you know, you've got this quite hard thing and you work it out and you're like, ooh, I just worked it out. Like, that, uh, that is a form of happiness, right? Mm. Now, it might, I, I hesitate to just say, well, it's covered by happiness because, like, it might in the moment actually be quite frustrating and if, like, you, you measured it on a hedon scale, it might yeah. be like, but nonetheless, I think if you go to higher and lower pleasures and a pluralistic conception and blah, 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 you get to a point of view where where the, 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 those sorts of conscious experiences are existing in the world is something we value and something we would want to preserve and promote. Mm. I, all other things being equal, I would rather live in a society where, not all the time, of course, but occasionally people were solving complex chess problems or some similar sort of abstract games than one in which they weren't, right? That's all I'm committing to. Um, and so mm. to track that to the Vulcans, um, I don't think that's assuming anything sort of intrinsic about them down the line of your argument. I'm just saying if you stripped out everything that I'm saying is, is valuable in terms of consciousness, you'd be... It, it wouldn't just be like they wouldn't have hedons. It's like they wouldn't they wouldn't have a theory of mind. They wouldn't be able to plan or strategize or think. You you would end up with something that was pretty dull and mute at the end of the day. And mm. yeah, maybe we wouldn't have strong moral obligations towards that thing. So that's that's sort of more mm. like my argument. Yeah, good. I, again, I don't um, have a, a view on this. I've, I've worked out myself so this is good to have but no, i'm working I'm this just unraveling the there as well but i don't know I, I maybe the hedonistic utilitarian again just bites the bullet and says no you don't have moral value if you can't feel pleasure pain happiness or suffering and i mean you say like you'd rather live in a saying. yeah if, if if you this this world in which you've got all these people solving like chess problems have you ever like being in a chess club or something, Toby, or hung out with chess players? No, I'm a trash chess player. It's literally just something that came into my head. Well, it's not fun. It's not <laughs> like I'd rather live in a world without chess players. <laughs> Would you not rather live in a world in which, um, and I'm probably going to show my colours, which I always do at some point in the, these conversations <laughs> as a John Stuart Mill stan. Would you not mm. rather live in a world in which there was just a sort of vast pluralism of different hobbies that people had, and that there were all sorts of different conscious experiences that they were having as a result of it, and the same yeah. people, you know, um, it's not just that one person might play chess and another um, 
might be really into go-karting is that the same person would do both in their lives and experience both yeah. and sort of make their own mind up about what they like. And instead of just being a dial that's either at seven or eight, um, it's much more like a rich tapestry of various mm. different sorts of threads that you pull together. And the ultimate judgment isn't... Rel Sorry, there's a little bit of background noise. The ultimate judgment isn't relativistic. It's not that there's there's um you can have a bigger and richer and more beautiful tapestry but at the end of the day the judgment of value is a pluralistic one and in some sense an aesthetic one um mm. that doesn't doesn't ever map down to just like this this dial um and that's that's sort of what we're going for we we yes i want the the chess playing to be part of the world as part of the the the, the tapestry I'll, i i don't know if that made any sense at all no, I think it does, but I think that's more of a like a, just a psychological point, right? About what gives us these positive experiences and a variety. Yeah. Yeah, variety yeah. is the spice of life, right? If it, to to paraphrase what you're saying, and that's a good thing. We don't want to kick out the wordle players and the chess players mm. and from from the city. Yeah, if if that's what you're into, then yeah, yeah. I, and, and, I, I, you, I'm not a fan, but you might you might like that kind of stuff. But, yeah, um, but, but also, even if you don't like it, taken as the overall arc of your life, it might just yeah. enrich your tapestry a bit more to just have had it there and experienced it, even if you've rejected it. But to, to, to bring yeah. that back to the problem we're having, um, if you took out all of the threads that I'm saying mm. make this tapestry, you're really left with almost nothing at all. And... You know, I'm not just imagining here a creature that, like, could pilot a spaceship right. and think and solve problems, but just doesn't, mm -hmm. like, if you stabbed it, it wouldn't hurt. Um, yeah. It wouldn't be able to think, it wouldn't be able to solve problems or sp pilot us. It wouldn't really be able to do anything. Or at least if it did, it would do it as a zombie. That's what yeah, I'm imagining I think... there now. If you but... took out everything, I think is valuable. Yeah, I think uh, Andy, who hosts co-hosts the podcast, the Pan Psychast, with me, has a similar view. He just doesn't think you can have these states. Once you take away all that tapestry, as you say, mm -hmm. all those conscious experiences, you, you're really left with with nothing. Consciousness is to be conscious, like of, of of some kind of value judgment, maybe or something like that. But I don't think, perhaps, like, personally, I, I I don't don't follow that. I I suppose. Let me think about this. Mm. Yeah, a little bit more. Careful. If you, so the zombie doesn't feel it when you stab it. Right? The zombie doesn't have conscious experiences. All of its brain processes go on in the dark. The imitation man like, doesn't actually experience the world. Do you want to? But there's the, but the Vulcan does experience it, right? Mm. The Vulcan does experience it, but just doesn't feel good or bad about it. So there still is like a tapestry of neutral states. It's not, it's not red and green. It's just grey all the way down. Right. Um, so before I go, do you want to just quickly tell people what we've been talking about zombies and we haven't defined it? Tell people what zombies are. Uh, philosophic zombies. Right, because you, you're probably better equipped to do that than me, and I realise that might be a bit. If people don't know about zombies, then th they might be a bit yeah, baffled as to what we're talking about here. So, everyone who's listening to the show knows Toby. Okay, Toby is a normal conscious creature. He has. He likes the taste of coffee. Hmm. He likes the sound of Fifty Cent, and he dislikes. Adam Sandler movies, right? He has a conscious experience of them and he feels bad about them when okay, he watches so you're, them. You're about half right there. <laughs> <laughs> now, Toby has a zombie brother mm -hmm. who he brings on to host the show sometimes when regular conscious Toby's feeling a little bit under the weather. He's a bit exhausted from making all of this great content for all of his listeners. And so zombie Toby comes on and he's physically indistinguishable from conscious Toby. He does all the same things. He says the same things. He tells you that it hurts when you punch him in the face and you leave him a bad review on iTunes. He says, that really upset me. But he doesn't actually undergo any of the experiences. So a zombie is, if you took me physically, 
recreated me. Question is, would consciousness necessarily be entailed by replicating the physical properties alone? Can you deduce consciousness from the things that physical science can describe about me? And the philosophical zombie says, well, no, like I can conceive of this um, and I conceive and, and I think it's possible that if you recreated me physically, then I wouldn't have this. And now I'm adding perhaps more things to load than need be, but this seemingly non-physical thing, this thing that doesn't seem to be able to be captured in the language of science. And one good thought experiment to get you to think about this, and, and Susan Blackmore uses this one, and I think Dave Chalmers uses it in a, in a book in the early 90s in The Conscious Mind. Imagine at some point in our evolutionary history, we have conchies and zombies. Some homo sapiens are conscious, some are, uh, some are completely zombies in the but they act the same way. And Susan Blackmore says, they're completely physically indistinguishable. So why would evolution favor conchies over zombies? It doesn't seem like it does have a reason. It doesn't seem like it does have a function. Mm. So it doesn't look, as some popular writers on consciousness at the moment are suggesting, it doesn't seem, says Blackmore, that consciousness has an evolutionary purpose. And so that's, uh, there's a few things there to get um, listeners to, I guess. Yeah, thank you for that. That was great. Um, I do find the... Um, we can maybe... Well, we're coming up on time. We can maybe close with consciousness and evolution because I do... That is interesting, isn't it? Um, mm. I. That was a really great cover of that. While you were speaking, um, I think I was able to get in my head a little bit clearer what I was trying to say about these here Vulcans. So mm. I think we're discussing a few types of th hypothetical creatures here, and it's probably right. worth separating them out. So at, at, at one end, you might have a zombie Vulcan, according to mm -hmm. like what you've laid out. I, according to the views I'd laid forward, if I'm going to be consistent, I think I have to just say we wouldn't have moral obligations towards the zombie Vulcan. Um, right. Or if we did, it would be... You know, like how people used to think that dogs were like this? Dogs didn't have inside lives, and that... I think Kant thought this, actually. Yeah. That dogs didn't have inside lives, we didn't have moral obligations towards them. But nonetheless, he thought we probably shouldn't torture dogs, because it would brutalise people and make us more likely to... to um, behave badly towards beings that do have inside lives. Um, mm. I like how anyone can have a dog and think, yeah, that thing doesn't have an inside life, I don't know. But that's another story. So if, if we had zombie Vulcans, the types of moral obligations towards them would be much more secondary like that. It would be more like, would it brutalise us to torture this thing, you mm. know? Um, but I think I have to say, yeah, it would be like our moral obligations towards a computer or something like that, or a robot, you know? But then... I think me and you are, 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 in, are, are constructing different types of, of Vulcans. And what I was trying to say is if you took out everything I deem to be a conscious experience that um, is potentially informative of our morality, you really mm -hmm. wouldn't end up with anything interesting at all you'd end up with something almost approximating a zombie but another way of putting that same thought is i think you're imagining um a more complex being that like has thoughts and can yep. strategize and is capable of logical thought um mm. it's just like it doesn't hurt when you stab it it doesn't feel good when you feed it, like that sort of thing, right? Yeah. So another way of putting that thought is, for me, perhaps not for Bentham, right? For Bentham, the being you're thinking of, he might have to say, okay, then yeah, it's not showing up on the felicit calculus, I have yeah. a moral obligation. According to a sort of more expansive, um, pluralistic conception of utility that I'm advocating mm. for, the being you're describing would clearly have conscious experiences that are valuable, mm -hmm. not valuable, and we would, it would register on our moral radar. 
perhaps not in yeah. the same way as a person would, but I think by... Th- th- this is why I went to chess. By having the capacity for logical thought to think, to make plans, mm. to make inferences, even separate from feeling good or bad about them, those are states of consciousness that, that we mm-hmm. are at least potentially morally interested in. Um, so I think it would... I don't have like... it would For me, the being you're imagining would show up on my moral radar and I think I can say that without contradiction because I'm using a much more expansive conception of yeah. utility um, It might, I might have to be committed to something like it would show up on my moral radar in a different way to a mm. person but it wouldn't be like just a mute point like the zombie would I think that's yeah. what I'm trying to say Yeah I think that's, a, that's exactly right I just wonder how many of your fellow utilitarians are happy to expand the idea of utility uh, beyond uh, to, to two neutral states as well. Um, it, obviously, Bentham and, um, and Singer um, wouldn't be giving moral value to, to the Vulcan, and so perhaps it gives them a, a bit of a problem. But I wonder, out for one human being in the, in the five Vulcans, have you got, you got a decision on that? Train's coming, Toby. You haven't got that long. So the Vulcans, see, it's the, a Vulcans, fast train. the Vulcans are at least as intelligent as us, or more. They're yeah, just, but they're just as intelligent as the other humans. As the one here, the five Vulcans are just as intelligent as the one human on the other track. Let's say they're, no, isn't it? they literally live the same lives. They're indistinguishable. All things are equal. That is a really good question. Well, Chalmers thinks it would be monstrous for you to kill the five Vulcans instead of the one person. And I'm not sure. I, I still don't know what I'd do. I think I'd just freeze by the track and, and claim ignorance. But can I share as you're thinking about it? Do you want yeah. me to read uh, Jeremy Bentham's poem? Uh, yeah, 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 please. You read, 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 read me some poetry while I think through this. Intense, long, certain, speedy, fruitful, pure. Such marks in pleasures and pains endure such pleasures seek if private be thy end if it be public wide let them extend such pains avoid whichever be thy view if pains must come let them extend to few (laughs) (laughs) on a calculus and he wrote that (laughs) he sat down one day and thought i need something catchy and cool (laughs) that will help people remember the uh the factors that go into had on a calculus. Have you got a decision anyway? I am not unsympathetic to the view that it might have to be the Vulcans, um, mm. but I don't think it's obvious in the same way that apparently Chalmers would think it's obvious. Yeah. Um, I like I say, if you're going for the sort of rich tapestry view of valuable conscious mm. experiences, I think trade offs are really hard, um, and I think consequentialists get a bad name for perhaps being sometimes too willing not to face trade-offs because trade-offs exist right Mm. um but to sometimes i think what makes people uncomfortable about utilitarians is that they they seem they sometimes give the impression that trade-offs are easy and that they Mm -hmm. wouldn't it's almost like a visceral thing that we're just a bit creeped out by someone who would make those trade-offs without agonizing over it a little bit you know mm. what i mean i think it's more like that you're a ruthless bunch yeah i don't think it has to be that way um and there's, there's a purely empirical question which is like how representative is my version of mm. consequentialism i don't really know the answer there that you could do a survey or something you know um but I think on the consequentialist side, I think, you know, just listen to how you sound when you say, oh, it's just this, this is the right answer, and you're monstrous if you do otherwise. Regardless of if you're right or wrong, I think people just feel like you're kind of a jerk when you put it like that. (laughs) I think what I would say to non-consequentialists is trade-offs exist you can find real examples of trolley problems. And then yeah. there's obviously 
you know, many gradations of much less important trade-offs. And these are real challenges for consequentialists, not least mm. because in reality we don't know the certain outcomes of picking a particular path, right? That is a mm. problem for consequentialists. But it's no less of a problem for any other moral theory. Like, mm -hmm. I think the Anne Frank example is, is, is like a genuinely hard one to save your family, would you give up another family? Right, and that's yeah. the choice. Um, would you do it, Toby? Probably, right? Yeah, I think would, again, would you? It'd, it'd be, it, it would sound. It's. I think it's a monstrous. If you, I, I think yes, I, yes, I would. Whether I should or not, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the jury's out for me. I, I need to think through a little think, bit more. I think what I'd actually do. I think if you put people under that much psychological pressure, their brains just sort of break. And what comes yeah. out... Yeah. I think in reality, I could do basically anything, because I just don't think I'd be thinking clearly. Mm. Um, yeah. I think there's limitations. I think the classic one of do you save your husband, wife, mother versus the guy that's going to cure cancer and save a billion lives. Mm. Um, I think what people never ask in that one is would the wife want to be saved knowing that the cost would be a billion lives right yeah i wouldn't yes i wouldn't if it was me versus you sorry mate i like you you're a nice guy i'm choosing myself if it's me <laughs> he's you picking me Are no, you no, picking I'm, me oh, if, it, if it's one of us i'm picking me um <laughs> but if it's me versus you and a billion other people okay fine if it, Toby, if it was me versus you, I'd, I'd give you the gift of life. Oh, and, but my oh. my moral virtue knows no bounds. Um, but anyway, that was a sort of long, waffly thing of saying, I think people think these sorts of things are like specifically challenging for consequentialism, was actually, they're just mm. challenging, period. And what people mm. tend to do on in reality is not, proceed from a single coherent moral worldview. They tend to right. kind of draw from instinct and a little bit of virtue ethics, a little bit of deontology, a little bit of utilitarianism, and just kind of muddle through, you know? And yeah. that maybe isn't the worst thing in the world. Cool. Um, your book, uh, What is Freedom? Mm. It's for if there's Panpsychast listeners listening or something like that for our, our crossover. And um, when, when does it come out and is it available in the UK? Oh yeah, well thanks for letting me plug on my own show. Um yeah, it's um out in the it's already out in the US and it's out in the UK cool. on February. Oh, it's already out in the US. Mm -hmm. When did it come out in the US? Oh god, like a month or two ago. Um, wow, cool. Because Congratulations. I, I was, yeah, thanks. Um and it's out in the U the UK about a month, eighteenth of mm -hmm. um February. Um, do you want to... I mean, we covered your book a little bit. Is is there anything like... I This is good. I really like this book, um, even though this really isn't my field. Although I think we found an interesting crossover yeah, between certainly, both yeah, of our things. We were both, um, like you say, with the very different topics, but mm. underlying the podcast and moving into the, the, the world of the written word, we both went on a, on a similar journey there. Yeah, you almost interviewed me there, and I was I was thinking on the fly. Like, that was talking about conscious experience. That was literally what was coming into my head, so I hope I made sense. Um, yeah, it's uh, much better than just the, like we said from the very start, it's better yeah. than the just, you ask me a question and I speak. I, I enjoyed that a lot more, and hopefully the listener yeah. will enjoy it too, because um, they're, they're, they're here for you, Toby, not for me. Uh-huh. Well, um... But let's let's close with your book. Is there anything else going on in the book you'd like to draw people's attention to, or like mm. um, any points? Well, I'll I'll firstly give you the last word. Any points in closing, just summarising anything that we just said, and then um, yeah, you know, I'll hold up your book again. Philosophers on consciousness. Um, any other things about the book that might be interesting, or that mm. like you know you want to make people aware of well i i don't want to give them because i could say a lot on on, on a few mm. points that, about the book philosophically i suppose the the simplest thing to say is that if you haven't if you're listening to this and you haven't done any philosophy of mind at all or if you, you haven't done it for a while 
or if you've done quite a bit of it mm. and you want to pick up on some of the latest developments in the field, then I, I really think and hope that the, the book has something to offer you. I, I mean, I, the, the, the podcast that, that I do, and I know that, that Toby believes in this as well, is that you can, you can carry with you um, a listener of any ability if you do things right and if you differentiate right and if you make it engaging and, mm. and accessible. And I, the philosophers that are in that book are, it's so cool to see them write with such broad brush strokes, but so carefully. And that's something you don't see too much in, in the world of academic philosophy. Who are nitpicky and, and really small issues, and and none of the the stuff that gets people engaged when they first start to fall in love with philosophy, like calling somebody's view the silliest claim that's ever made, or saying someone's view panpsychism is equivalent to pancrapism. Like that's 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 what that's funny. That's good. That's engaging, and it does carry a serious mm. philosophical point. And so the book's full of stuff like that. And 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 I think yeah, you know, if. If you've got any inkling of a sense of view or any inkling in the sense of interest in uh, philosophy, then yeah, it's a it's a it's a book you should enjoy. I had not heard the silliest claim before. Well, I'd heard the claim, ah, I hadn't cool. heard it described as the yeah as the silliest. It's great claim. having them back to back as well, isn't it? Like Dennett and Dennett literally, we have Strauss and Dennett responding to each other in the body of the text, mm. uh, which is, which is really really cool to have them side by side. And there's quite a few big clashes in in the book and no one pulls back any punches and when someone references someone's work you know we during the production of it we said this person says this like do you yeah, want to you add often give them a chance to respond you're like well i yeah. put that claim to them and this is what they said so yeah it's yeah. a very um interactive interwoven type of work and i'll give you another um sort of plug i think if you're interested in the philosophy of consciousness mm. yeah definitely have a look at this but i would actually say like if you're more just like interested in philosophy and this is like an area you haven't touched much i would also recommend this book you know it's it's not like um something that's going to take you a long time to read or anything and it's mm. just like a nice thing to have just so that you have that if you have a general interest in philosophy this would be quite a nice book to have to just have that area covered so that if someone says something like zombies or hard problem or whatever you have like a, a general knowledge of the basic ideas out there Mm -hmm. um, so I think it could, I would recommend it at both levels. Well, I don't even know the high level, but like for someone who this isn't my area of philosophy, um, I would recommend it as just like a nice resource to have so you're not completely mm. flying blind there. Thank you, David. This would have been really awkward if you had an interview and you were just like, I wouldn't buy this book. I didn't <laughs> enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was it was really dumb and stupid, and I can't believe it's uh, actually been published. Over. Thanks, Toby. I really yeah. appreciate it. No, but um, um, it, it's genuine. I mean, I go with um, dinner rules, which is to say, if you go round to someone's house and they cook you dinner, I think the rules are: you never lie, but if you're thinking something <laughs> nasty, you just keep it to yourself, right? <laughs> Well, that sounds ominous now. That sounds, no, 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 but so, same, same, same rules with books. Like I put up um, some if there's something I don't like about it, not yeah. I if I don't like the book, I'll usually just keep that to myself. Really? But if I like I think... it, I'll... If I'm interviewed, I'm not going to have someone on and like be like, well, your book was shit. Like, I'm not going <laughs> to do that. Um, Although I think there'll be an audience for that. I think you should do a spin-off show. But I Just, will say if I do like okay. it, I'll challenge people. I say, I, you know, I think we disagree here. Yeah. But you can say I think we disagree. You can disagree with something that's a good or a bad book. I'll never just, yeah. I'll never just say, mate, you, you cannot write for shit. I'll never say that to someone on air, mm. at least. If someone sends me... Yeah, thank me... you. Don't, don't say it to me either once we stop recording. <laughs> that... <laughs> no, no, I liked this. Um, and I haven't pursued it fully yet like i said i gave it um i only got it a few days ago so i gave it like a fast read um but i got the gist of it on a fast read so that must mm. mean like it's it's reasonably accessible um yeah so and i think that's um i think on on the blurb Stephen fry says something like i find it difficult to yo. do philosophy and i didn't have to reread anything and i think that's the that mm. that captures so nicely like a philosophy book where you shouldn't have to go back and really, really struggle to just make sense of what's been yeah. said. And Eugene Nagasawa, who works at Birmingham, who's, who's absolutely brilliant, one of my favorite philosophers, when we did an interview with him, he said, when people finish, when I finish talking at a conference or something, 
all I hope for is that people understand the ideas. People disagree, if people think it's a load of rubbish, then then fine by them. Even better if they don't. But the goal number one is clear, engaging. Um, and I think that I'm, I'm really glad to hear that you were able to pick up the book and read it through uh, quickly and then and not have to go back and be like, I don't know what's going on here. Right. I think making these ideas from these leading philosophers accessible and clear is the, is the is goal number one. So, yeah, that's uh, it's the highest compliment you could have paid me, Toby. Good. Good. The, the, yeah, the worst thing in the world isn't if someone disagrees with you. It's if someone disagrees with some view that they're attributing to you, but it's like, yo, that was not what I was trying to communicate. Because <laughs> yeah. that just means you've got it wrong, you know? Yeah. Um, all right, let's... Um... Let's pause there. Um, that was cool. That was fun. Um, thanks for putting me on the spot. Um, cheers, Jack. I appreciate it. No, I really enjoyed it. Good to catch up with you, Toby. Take care and uh, yeah, and best of luck with everything. You too, mate.